Happy Friday, folks, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting May 25th, 2015. Let's jump right in with our daily security bites. Tuesday's story is an IRS data breach. Today, the IRS reported that criminal attackers gained unauthorized access to over 100,000 taxpayer records. Now, according to IRS, this happened because of the Get Transcript application, which is an app that allows taxpayers to download previous tax returns. But to do so, they have to authenticate by sharing things like their social security number, their address, their date of birth, and other sort of uh, information to uh, validate who they are. Now, according to the IRS, criminal attackers must have gained access to this sensitive information via non-IRS means. They don't know exactly how, but obviously these attackers gain access to that information for around 200,000 victims. And between February and May, uh, these attackers have been using that information via the Get Transcript application to steal tax return information. And they've only been uh, successful in about half the cases, which is why they made off with a hundred thousand records so far. Now this is pretty significant information. It's everything an attacker would need to do identity theft. And in some cases your tax return may contain financial information like banking numbers and routing numbers and things like that. Now if you live in the US and you paid taxes this year, you're probably wondering if you're affected. The IRS says they're going to send emails to the 200,000 victims, including the 100,000 victims that actually had their information stolen. They also say they're going to pay for credit monitoring for the victims that actually lost information, and they've temporarily disabled the Get Transcript application. As an aside, you might remember a previous tax story from a few months ago where criminals were filing fraudulent TurboTax returns to get their victims money back. Now, it hasn't been proven, but this may be related to that particular attack. In any case, it's a very interesting story. If you are in the U.S., you might want to check for that IRS email. And be sure to be very careful when you're sharing this sort of information online. And Wednesday's story is a mysterious text message that crashes iPhones. The story first showed up, as far as I can tell, as a couple of Reddit posts followed by some Twitter and Facebook posts, where users were sharing a very specially crafted text message that could make your iPhones and iPads restart. Essentially, this seems to be a flaw in Apple's core text framework. This is a component used to kind of render text, and it also takes Unicode characters and translates them to special symbols as well. Anyways, the flaw seems to have to do with how the notifications work with the messaging app. So basically, it won't work if you're actually in the messaging app, but if you get a pop-up notification for a specially crafted message, your iPhone might appear to reboot. In reality, it's not totally rebooting, it's just respringing the springboard. Now, so far, this does not seem to be a dangerous exploit. This just seems to be a crash bug. There is a chance it's some sort of memory corruption that bad guys can exploit, but so far it just seems like a denial of service flaw. One easy way to mitigate the issue is turn off notifications on your iOS device. Another thing to note is this probably affects more than just iOS. The Cortex engine is an OS X as well, so this could affect things like Safari and other OS X applications as well. In fact, there's even stories of perhaps putting this maliciously crafted Unicode as the SSID of a wireless network, perhaps causing iOS devices to reboot too. Now the flaw today might seem new, but this similar sort of issue actually existed back in 2013 as well. Back then, iOS 6 and 7 was out, and it also suffered from a flaw having to do with rendering Unicode Arabic text that would result in text messages that could respring your phone. So this is actually the reoccurrence of a flaw we've seen before. In any Anyways, it's not a huge deal, but I have recreated the issue so you can see it happen here. If you're an iOS or OS X user, do expect Apple to release updates, but I wouldn't lose any sleep over this vulnerability. Thursday's story is some new crowdsourced ransomware called Tox. Motherboard wrote an article today about a new variant of ransomware. And what's interesting about it isn't so much the ransomware itself, but how the malicious actors are distributing this 
as malware as a service for free. So let's talk about this first. This was first discovered by a couple of security vendors, McAfee and Security Zap, who found a dark web or deep web site that's distributing this free ransomware. Now, if you don't know what the dark web or the deep web is, essentially Tor, the Onion Network, is an anonymizing service that allows you to browse online anonymously. On top of that, Tor allows websites to put up anonymous websites that are more difficult to actually find the physical location of. In any case, there is a website on the deep web called Talks, and it's a site where the authors of this specific ransomware are allowing anyone to sign up and download ransomware ransomware for free. And this is pretty typical crypto ransomware. Uh, this particular service generates a SCR or fake screensaver uh, file that if you run the file, it's going to encrypt a bunch of files on the victim's computer, then try to get them to pay a certain amount of Bitcoin to get those files back. Now, malware as a service is something that's gone on for a long time. There's a very rich underground economy where uh, cyber attackers share and sell tools and stolen data and things that make it easier to attack victims. But one interesting aspect about Tox is the fact that the author is offering this ransomware for free. The way he's monetizing is by taking 30% of the victim's ransom as a cut. So basically, it's up to people that download this free ransomware to figure out how to distribute it among a bunch of victims. And for whatever ransom they get from the victims, 30% is automatically taken by these authors. Now, the ransom where itself is not that interesting. It does use some evasive tactics to get past a lot of different AV, but there are many different AV vendors that catch it. In fact, just so you know, if you're a WatchGuard customer, both our AV vendor can detect this particular ransomware. And if you have APT Blocker, which is our advanced threat protection service, we can actually catch this malware in our advanced sandbox as well. So we can protect you from this. So what are the learnings here? Well, first of all, ransomware has really increased in popularity. I suspect ransomware is going to continue to grow as a great way for bad guys to monetize cybercrime. You definitely want defenses that can catch ransomware. Another interesting thing is the fact that only a very small portion of AV companies can catch a lot of this new evasive ransomware. These bad guys are using techniques and repacking their ransomware regularly to get past signature-based AV. So make sure to use more modern advanced threat protection services to make sure you can catch all this modern malware. Anyways, it's just an interesting new evolution in malware as a service. The idea of offering exploit kits or malware for free and actually crowdsourcing, getting other attackers to infect people for you and taking a cut of those profits. I suspect we'll see the criminals doing much more of this in the future. Friday's story is all about North Korean cyber warfare. Today there were two stories about North Korean cyber espionage and cyber attack operations. The first comes from the BBC who interviewed a North Korean college professor who defected in 2004. Professor Kim was a computer science college professor at a university, and in this interview with the BBC, he shared a whole lot of information about uh, North Korean's alleged Bureau 121, which is the military cyber attack team North Korea uses that is allegedly based in China. Now, according to Professor Kim, this is a team of over 6,000 people who uh, do a lot of very sophisticated attacks. In fact, Professor Kim claims that they could destroy a city and kill people with cyber attacks. Now, I think this particular statement is a little bit hyperbolic or FUDDY. FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It is true that Critical infrastructure, industrial control systems, and SCADA facilities do connect to networks and sometimes have software vulnerabilities bad actors could exploit to do bad things. In fact, Stuxnet did just that to a nuclear enrichment facility in Iran. However, jumping from that to destroying cities may be a bit far-fetched. There are fail-safes and places humans can intervene to, to stop any sort of huge damage from happening. Now that said, I do not think it's out of the question that a cyber attack could result in a human death. In fact, it's a prediction I've made before. But I don't think that we're going to see North Korea destroying cities anytime soon. 
Also in the news, Reuters released a story that comes from unnamed U.S. intelligence sources saying that the U.S. government also tried to attack North Korea back when it was launching Stuxnet against Iran. According to this story, they were also trying to get into North Korea's industrial control systems and government systems. However, they were unable to do so, largely because North Korea is so mysterious and are so good at cutting themselves off from the rest of the world. So it is interesting to see that North Korea is building a big cyber attack team. Meanwhile, other nation states, perhaps even the U.S. government, seem to be attacking back. Now you might be wondering, as a normal IT guy or business person, how this nation state stuff affects you. But one of the things I do believe is these nation state effects do have a trickle down effect on the entire threat landscape. While these nation states are attacking each other, often their threats, which are more sophisticated than the run of the mill malware, does leak. And when it does leak, the criminal element, who's very opportunistic, tends to take advantage of some of the techniques they use. And as a result, malware overall is evolving much quicker than before. So as a practical tip, while North Korea or the US government probably won't attack you directly, you really do need to up your security game to survive in today's threat environment. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you found it interesting. As always, please visit our blog at blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. Besides other posts, that's where you can find this weekly video, as well as a reference section that contains a ton of useful links to other interesting security stories. You can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want these videos more regularly. Finally, one really quick show note. I'm going to be traveling for various security conferences over the next few weeks. While I'm going to try to do my daily security bites, I may be in different time zones and may not have time to do them every single day. So don't expect me to follow the normal schedule the next two weeks, but I will post some videos. With that said, as always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.